Yes, uh, we love to have everyone engage in, in what we call a chat or more interactive than just a one-way uh, presentation. And we are just so pleased that Lonnie Rao could join us today as a co-host to kick this off, looking at action research as it relates to uh, democracy. And uh, I, I always love to hear the voices of the persons presenting as opposed to a formal introduction. Lonnie, do you mind? Uh, sharing how you come to this work and this particularly relevant and important topic. I'll just say I've been thinking about these issues for a number of years. <laughs> so what I want to share today is kind of my latest uh, thinking. As, as of uh, 9 p.m. last night, <laughs> I ended a revisiting of uh, all of the themes that I hope to, uh, first of all, share, and then hopefully there'll be time for chatting. Thank okay, and, and just to give a context for Lonnie, Lonnie has been doing action research for decades. He organized a, a conference at University of San Diego, and um, he was the driving force that started the Action Research Network of the Americas. He's uh, edited the Action Research Handbook, He's been the glue that hold together a worldwide community of people who have been involved in action research. And he's started the Social Publishers Foundation to help give a voice to people who are doing action research in communities and not in university settings. Um, so he's done an amazing things for the community of action research. Um, and I just wanted to, to uh, acknowledge all of that before he gets started. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> yeah, I did a PowerPoint to try to keep all my thoughts uh, focused. So let me go to that. I was very struck, uh, as I'm sure most of you were, by the news of February 23rd regarding the attack by Russia on Ukraine. And I'm a follower of a historian, uh, Heather Cox Richardson, who publishes an e-newsletter that she calls Letters from an American. And she sends it out, uh, gosh, pretty much six days a week. And on her February 23rd post, she included this statement that Russia's invasion of Ukraine not only has broken a long period of peace in Europe, it has brought into the open that authoritarians are indeed trying to destroy democracy. And that hit me hard, not just the horrible tragedy for the people of Ukraine, but the fact that I think she hit the nail on the head, as we say, that it is indeed of the strongest indication that we've had of an organized authoritarian effort to try to destroy democracy. So this then, of course, has led to questions about the relevance for action research and the teaching of action research. And I was sort of struck initially by the fact that you take any one of the common definitions of action research and in teaching action research, we've all used these, that uh, here's Alan Feldman's uh, definition, which I think is perfectly good one, of what is uh, action research. Yet, in my thinking over the last two years, the question comes up about the relations of action research and the politics of knowledge. And that discussion is often marginalized in university settings. And so what I'm hoping to do is just share some thoughts with you all that um, hopefully uh, might be incorporated into some of the teaching that's done. I believe that it's in these relations of action research and the politics of knowledge, that's where our stake 
and the efforts to destroy democracy are, this is just the background as to the context, I think, for why I see it as strongly as I do, that knowledge democracy as a, a concept really is rooted in resistance to the monopolization of expert knowledge producers. It's often, sometimes even exclusively talked about in relation to global north-south splits in the politics of uh, development. And this has been evident from the mid 20th century up to our time. And, and yet it's not an exclusive issue in terms of global north, global south issues and concerns. The democratization of knowledge production and the expansion of challenges to all forms of elitist domination have been joined at the hip, I would say, for at least the last 50 years. So I think action research, although it doesn't always expressly articulate this relation with knowledge democracy, it's, it's there. And so when I first started grappling with this, uh, starting about five years ago, the, the issue for me came up, it, you know, it's a, a common expression. People say knowledge is power. And so for me, what is quite self-evident is if knowledge is power, then knowledge has a politics. It's, it's a given. And there are many, many contrasts with the different perspectives on uh, power and knowledge. I find uh, this one from Sheila Hardy to be compelling. Uh, sadly, we, we lost her in 2016, but she was a theologian and author. Um, this is one of her statements. Under businesses tutelage, Knowledge becomes a means to an end, quantitative, pragmatic, and marketable. The result is an anti-intellectualism that creates a numbing of critical inquiry into the uses of power in society and the source of ethical value in life. And I, I, very, I found myself very much agreeing with her on that statement, that we are accustomed, especially those of us who have developed our careers within higher education, we are very accustomed to, by now, the notion of the knowledge economy, which is all about the marketability of knowledge and knowledge as a commodity. But while that was emerging, that notion of knowledge economy. There also have been very powerful critiques of the pairing of knowledge production and science and economy. And so uh, we find De Sosa Santos, who has uh, several books out examining this issue. And he discusses the notion of the monoculture of scientific knowledge playing a key role in neoliberal globalization's suppression of social emancipation in the global South. So here, although we're all quite accustomed to scientific knowledge as a crucial aspect of modernization and progress, De Sousa Santos kind of turns this notion on its head and says that the monoculture scientific knowledge is a tool of oppression. And that the way it plays out globally is that this monoculture presents barriers to more diverse views of other ways of knowing. My view is that for teaching action research, the minimum that we can do is to open up the complexities around this issue of going beyond action research as an approach or a method related to social sciences 
that we can open up a discussion of the complexities in relation to knowledge production and dissemination and action research. So these are just kind of three grounding points for, for me and the work that I try to do. First of all, knowledge democracy is not anti-science, but it challenges this notion of a monoculture. And I think one of the nicest expressions of this you'll find in Michelle Fine's book, just research in contentious times. And um, I retired in August of 2018 after 23 years at the University of San Diego and a few other years at other institutions. And the last semester when I taught research methods, I included Michelle Fine's book. And the students loved this book for the most part. Those who were socially conscious and wanted to be active in social justice issues as a part of their practices as educators, they loved this book. Those who were the more conservative students, to be honest, they were not as excited by Michelle Fine's uh, work. So I found that was kind of, for me, a fitting way to and my formal career was to shake things up a bit. I also think one of the things that is crucial for us to do as teachers of action research and understanding the different traditions uh, uh, of action research and PAR. And a marvelous book came out in 2020 by Joanne Rappaport, who is uh, an anthropologist now she just retired also. The book is titled Cowards Don't Make History, Orlando Falls Border and the Origin of Participatory Action Research. It, it is a marvelous book, um, beautifully researched and written. I also, as a part of just thinking about talking with you all today, I've prepared a reading list which I've sent to Margaret and Linda, and probably uh, we'll find a way to get that posted to, to, your, to the Star Arc community. And lastly, I think it's crucial in teaching action research to make the case for practitioner research, to try to balance talking about action research as kind of another method in social sciences but to also balance pers the perspective with what's at stake when action research and participatory forms of research in general are used as part of grounded work of practitioners in work settings and communities. Now, in terms of exploring the complexities, I want to acknowledge the potential for um, forming alliances, and I know this will be not easy work, but the acknowledged war on science has rattled scientists um, worldwide. And I think it's an opportunity to try to enter into constructive dialogue. This is the wonderful, I took this photo at the climate march in San Diego back in 2017, this woman who, I don't know, for, I don't know her, she likely was a scientist. Maybe she was from UCSD up in La Jolla, or maybe she was from San Diego State. But her statement here is really important. The attack on science is so 12th century. And what she's referring to is that this whole thing that was, uh, beginning to become clear, the attack on science represents an effort really to roll back history by hundreds of years, by, by, by simply trying to take away the legitimacy of a scientific orientation towards knowledge. And so that scientists recognize the threat 
I think the stakes are enormous in this area and that there is some ground for shared concerns and dialogue. And here we see the April 2017 March, or it was the March for Science in San Diego. There was participation by 15,000 people that day. And there were more than a million people marching in 600 plus cities around the, the, uh, the world. And yet, as I was marching that day, I also was trying to remain mindful that my country has more climate change deniers than any other country on the planet. And so there is something in that, that clash that is crucial for uh, further dialogue and for action research, I believe, to help to begin to explore how do we unpack this. I'm a fan of uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's an ast as many of you I'm sure know, he's an astrophysicist and an author, he's a popular commentator. His statement at this time was that America's growing rejection of science is, quote, the beginning of the end of an informed democracy. So there's a recognition of the attack on democracy coming from uh, the science community. I also am a big fan of uh, naturalist and author Terry Tempest Williams, and she has said in one of her books, she has several, when minds close, democracy begins to close. Fear creeps in, silence overtakes speech. And this, I think, is another important issue for us to consider. So I would say the issues for teaching include these three. And I may, I'm going to stop after this and see where we are, because I have about five more slides that talk about strategies for engaging around this issue of the attack on democracy. But these three might be issues that some of you would be interested in taking up in terms of uh, teaching action research. First, first of all, the acknowledgement that knowledge is a contested space. And although I had my t-shirt uh, at the 2017 March, science is not a liberal conspiracy, I have to admit in all honesty that for many people, in this country, science is a liberal conspiracy. Higher education is a liberal conspiracy. News media is a liberal conspiracy with the exception of Fox News. So I think this notion of who sees the work that as a conspiracy that in part it's a statement contesting the notion of knowledge and whose knowledge counts, and that we have to find constructive ways to engage with this issue. And then, secondly, one that has keeps motivating me in many ways is Henry Giroux's. Uh, this is the title of one of his books: "The Violence of Organized Forgetting." And I think here is where we find the damage of big lies and misinformation. This is what we see happening in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The attempt to impose organized forgetting on people by just repeating the big lie, repeating it over and over and over again. The so-called notion of the election of 2020 having been stolen by Democrats and that Trump was supposedly the real winner. It's a lie. It's a big lie. And it represents Giraud's notion of the violence of organized forgetting, how it gets imposed on people who are the most vulnerable, the most marginalized, the most at risk. 
And the second issue for me is, and this is one that we could talk about for weeks and months, is the whole issue of expertise and what ex the challenges that expertise brings with it, as well as the opportunity. It was going all the way back to North Whitehead, the British mathematician and philosopher who pointed out that although these advances through specialized knowledge, training of people to have that specialized knowledge was a powerful and in many ways wonderful thing, it also produced minds that were in a groove, a narrow groove. And he was cautious all those decades ago about the result of having minds in a groove. So he put forth this notion that establishing credibility, reliability, and the effectiveness of a knowledge base of a profession is not the same as determining what is best for a community and how best to implement fair and just social policy. And so I think that's an issue where we need discussion about how action research and participatory action research come into an encounter with overly specialized knowledge and what it, what it does in people's lives. And then the last one as an issue for teaching is to help students to begin to grapple with what does it mean to decolonize knowledge production and dissemination? And the term that many of us are using for that is not. And so to, in addition to teaching uh, how action research is done, its meaning, et but all its methods, to discuss issues related to the decolonization of knowledge production. So I have some more slides, but I think for now, I, I'm going to stop at this one because I know I've gone beyond um, chatting. So my, my apologies. <laughs> That was that was very um, yeah. interesting and provocative, and it made me think of Dewey's book, uh, Democracy and Education, because he he proposed that unless students were practicing democracy in their school as they were growing up, if they didn't have a chance to run their school in some meaningful way, they wouldn't grow into citizens that had the sense of their power to affect and change things. And when we put in place educational programs that emphasize memorization and repetition rather than the kind of inquiry that um, Dewey was suggesting, we grow citizens that are ripe for um, falling into big lies or you know, the domination of expertise. I, you know, I agree with that. And um, the the essay that uh, SPF published by uh, uh, Eric Lintel, um on Scandinavian traditions of knowledge democracy, at the end of his essay, he links it with Dewey and uh, in a, a very thoughtful way. Um, I think the... I'll, I'll just say this, that um, I was starting to play around with an idea for a diagram last night. I think that the greater the civic illiteracy, the greater the potential for vulnerability to the big lie. And so the, I believe that the action research community would do very well in terms of a strategy by embracing civic literacy projects. 
because here we could do youth participatory action research, we could do community-based popular education, but to begin to explore with people, what does it mean to be literate in terms of civil society? Because it's more than just being able to read. It's understanding political dynamics, et cetera. Yeah. And last, I just wanna say, I sent the PowerPoint to uh, Margaret and to Linda. And so I'm hoping that can be posted as well as the reading list. And I would be more than happy to engage with any of you further on this issue of formulating strategies in relationship to um, how to respond to the attacks on democracy. What are some strategies that some of you think of that can, can counter, I mean, we had this Leave, uh, No Child Left Behind program for a long time in schools, which was the exact opposite of civic literacy. It was really um, the teacher knows the answer and learn the answer that the teacher knows. So it was a really a, a, a privileging of expertise and a, you know, don't bother to think because uh, you can't think as well as we can. So just learn this. And that really puts students in a position of being, being trained to trust authority. And then when authority lies to you, then there's real problems. So um, the opposite is a doing approach, which is to figure out why your answer is right or wrong. I know that in the uh, this PISA, the, science, the World Science Project, where they uh, examined uh, students from all over in their mathematical thinking, and Japan came out on top, and they said, well, we teach the American way. <laughs> <laughs> and they said that they, you know, they use Dewey as their foundation, and um, they came out the top in science, and we didn't. Um, and we had the intellectual uh, frame, but we lost it when we moved away from this important issue of inquiry. And one of the things that I like the best in one of the teacher examples is that when it that she said, when a, when a student gets a wrong answer, they, they don't try to get rid of it and substitute the right answer. They instead explore why that student had that wrong answer. And then at the end, they thank the student for bringing that idea to the group so that they could then figure out why it wasn't the right answer. So it wasn't like you're stupid for having the wrong answer, because here's the right answer over here. It was that in order to get right answers, we need to go through the thinking that helps us understand why this issue might not be as relevant as this other issue. And that process, the process of really exploring thinking is what is uh, sadly missing in American schools. I don't know how it is in other schools. Oh um, my gosh, Margaret. You're reminding me of the Tim's study, which was yeah, an international was, uh, study. Yeah. Uh, and they said our, our curriculum, particularly in mathematics, was described as an inch deep, a mile wide. Uh -huh. And the observations of classrooms, K-12 classrooms, this is primarily, uh, I'm looking at industrialized nations, but in the United States in particular, that one of the problems that we focus more on, quote, arithmetic, you talk about the rote memorization as opposed to mathematics, and the observers, and I, I'm not giving the actual data, I apologize, I'm very much summarizing, uh, that our teachers were quick to give the answers, right? To get to the end, kind of the two page approach to math. Here's the problem, here's how you do it. Here's 50, you know, challenges. Examples, As yeah. opposed to other teachers who go much more in depth. Yeah. It's a mile deep. <laughs> it could be yeah. an inch wide, but it's a mile deep. Just to give that metaphor to yep. illustrate. Matthew wanted to say something. Yeah, th thanks, Margaret. Um, I think it, it ties into this pluralistic knowledge, a notion of knowledges and an ecology of knowledges and looking at different ways of knowing. And that's what I think um, students and people tend to not be encouraged to explore. Um, the valorization of propositional knowledge and the academy's knowledge over and above experiential, uh, practical and other ways of knowing. And I think that's at the heart of a knowledge democracy for me is for us to be 
able to look at, at accepting other ways of looking at the world and how we embrace that rather than be fearful and narrowing it down. Yeah, that's excellent point. I, I think it, uh, it goes, it, it has to be that, um, for example, and there are 2023 ARNA conference South Bend, um, Canada. We are, the conference is being organized in partnership with tribal colleges in, in uh, Alberta. And what they, what they asked is, well, we want to do a conference that introduces people to land-based knowledge. Are you open to that? And we, we said, yes, very much so, because we think that's part of knowledge democratization. And we want to learn more what that looks like, what that feels like. So part of the conference uh, attendees will have the option of staying in teepees up in Jasper uh, National yeah, we Park. And we'll be exploring land-based knowledge from uh, more direct contact with the land. But I also think, Matthew, that there are implications for knowledge democracy in terms of advocacy in policy areas where too often we've allowed ourselves to be put in the position of, well, okay, we understand you guys are doing action research, but it doesn't really count as knowledge production because it's too localized, it's blah, blah, blah. And we've too often um, allowed ourselves to be backed into a corner with that. And we need to find ways to more assertively put forth that this knowledge is significant. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's also about that, again, going back to my um, point about ecology of knowledge, is it's not about just having lived experience or learned experience. It's about the ecology of both of them together. I think quite a lot of the times we, um, the dial goes over one way to just lived experience and then the dial goes back. back well, I mean, historically, it's always been a valorization of, of, of learned the, the, the academic but I think the dial can go the other way as well. So I think it's about a marriage between learned and lived experience and knowledge. Yeah, if Jack Wright was here, he would, uh, he would tell us the story of how he went from a high school teacher to the university, and he was basically told that his knowledge was useless, practical knowledge, and it would be supplanted by uh, theoretical and political and you know uh, a stream of different adjectives of the kind of uh, knowledge that the university owns. And, um, and he was incensed by that because he valued his knowledge. And so he's um, been very active in living theories and his whole career, he then went on to be a professor at that university and, and help train many action researchers, but when he left, so did action research. You know, I, I, I'm building on Matthew, your notion of this, of this swing back and forth. So there are times when, you know, something like action research takes hold and the universities are able to affect reasonable change. And then there are, and then the university also pushes back and you have a loss. But Dietzel wanted to say something. I don't know if you still, did you, would you like to add something? Well, it's so many things came to my mind listening to, <laughs> to, to Lonnie and to you in relation, for example, to what you meant by, by no child left behind. It really came to my mind, this experience I had teaching in New Jersey for three years under that policy and teaching science. And in that experience, I really must say that uh, it was really very theoretical in a way, because the schools in America have this uh, way of measuring kids to, in relation to external examinations. And so even though you might have a, a very interesting curricula, 
concerning, for example, this ecology of knowledge that Matthew was mentioning in science, for example, you are always, let's say, in prison concerning the evaluation, these external evaluations that value the schools and value the teachers and value everyone if you don't pass those examinations. So I, I cannot see this as a democracy of knowledge, really. I see this more like a dictatorship of knowledge concerning how external examinations really limit the knowledge of the, of the schools and the children. And that was under this policy of no child left behind. So it really worries me that people are really now going against knowledge in the streets of what Lonnie was showing up, us, this kind of demonstration, because somehow when I refer to that in my own situation in Venezuela, this is what we are having there, the same thing. It's like if, for example, now the, the universities don't get budgets, the teachers are very badly paid, and, and it seems like if the government has opened some universities just that follow the, the politics of the government. So they are supposed to be sociological universities in inverted commas, but in reality it's like an indoctrination of, oh. of, of people. Mm -hmm. So what kind of, of knowledge, what kind of freedom of knowledge is that? So it, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's something very complicated, no? Oh, when indeed. I see it mm -hmm. and I try to relate that to, to our own situation there, to, to, to try to apply these ideas in a particular context. Gates, in the United States, I mean, and in California, I've been a school administrator for over 40 years. And one of the things I learned quickly when I tried to buy textbooks that were, quote, not on the district adopted list is the powerhouse of school publishing companies was located in Texas. And there's such an economic control over the sales of those books. You just follow the money trail. So you mm -hmm. couldn't get monies. You had to fundraise on your own. If you mm -hmm. wanted to buy anything that wasn't being, you know, kind of spoon fed. And it reminds me of Jonathan Kozel's uh, sharing in a couple of conferences that I went to where, you know, this amazing person, he was fired for quote, curriculum deviation mm -hmm. in one setting because he chose to use like the works of Maya Angelou to reach kids that were in a setting that who were who were uh, black African-American kids who were thirsty, right? For characters and books that represented them and to whom they could relate. So he brought, <laughs> but, and he was fired, curriculum deviation. I mean, it's mm. just, it's ever present. It's not just now, I mean, this is over. I think I heard him talk about that 20 years ago, you know, but it still continues some of these practices. Um, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate yeah. and it takes champions to question that and to promote inquiry. Uh, Carlos. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to make a, a couple of uh, comments. So the first one is uh, what about uh, uh, Margaret said, which was uh, the experience of uh, Japan in which they say they were teaching the, um, the American way that means Dewey, no? And uh, that, that, that uh, they have some success uh, doing th in that way. And on the other side, uh, I just remember that the Japanese were very good in totally uh, total quality control in the industry. And where did they learn it? From the being, no? who was also an American. So it's uh, quite interesting that uh, uh, a couple of uh, uh, places in which they have copy, they have done better than the creators in that sense. And the other is about the um, uh, thing about knowledge, you know, because what the knowledge that uh, the schools used to give are the theoretical knowledge, uh, which are learned in the books, let's see. But that uh, there are uh, almost no, uh, um, let's see, uh, they don't work about the tacit knowledge. And, uh, in the real life, tacit knowledge is uh, maybe more important than um, than uh, this, uh, uh, let's see, explicit knowledge that uh, we learned in the school and uh, in the books. No? Because a lot of things that, for instance, there are in the books, and the book says 
it it uh, it must happen in that way when you go to the practice it doesn't work that way there are some little things that make a difference because uh, 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 that's the difference between let's see a, a very academic uh, way of uh, learning and the other is real life okay that was only my comments a sort of uh, comparison of that was we took uh, our ma students once to a the 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 teacher conference that we generally take them to got moved to a different time. And so we went to a, a, a knowledge based, a, a research based cognitive science uh, conference instead. And one of the comments the teachers made really um, surprised me at the end. I mean, first of all, they were all men on the, all men talking. Teacher group was all, was, you know, majority female. So we had that going. Uh, they did speak on the last day as a group, but there, um, they didn't even know that the research was going on around their schools. So here's this whole industry creating knowledge that's supposed to be used in their classrooms. They didn't even know they were doing it. You know, they were teachers and they were creating their knowledge in their schools and getting knowledge from their colleagues in there. They had no idea that there was this cognitive science in education approach taking place. And so you can see how disconnected the two are. Not It isn't even a fight. It's a they don't even know that the other side is doing this work um, that is supposedly relevant for their, for their classrooms. The knowledge that they have, they value, um, and that knowledge is an is not incorporated in the kind of research that the cognitive sciences were doing. Yeah, that's the point that another uh, wonderful contributor who we lost is the author of this book, uh, Gerald Pine, who was at uh, Boston College. This book was published in 2009. The subtitle of the book is building knowledge democracies. And he had come to the recognition over a very long career in higher education that the way to counter what Margaret is describing is to actually have knowledge democracies built in schools. And so he was calling for really a reorganization of professional development of, of teachers. And it's, it's one of my favorite books um, still, still today. Um, well, and that's yeah. it. If we think about lesson study in Japan, to go back to the, a, a successful model of education, um, they, they um, all the teachers do lesson study as a way to learn how to teach which is to spend a whole semester, a team of six teachers study one lesson and they all teach it and they all watch each other teach it. And they try to understand, they try to keep the teaching constant and study what the students do. We try to keep, let the teachers do whatever they want and keep the students constant. In our lesson plans, it will say the student will do X, like there's a, a command that the students have to do this in this lesson. Whereas in Japan, it's the teacher will do this, and then let's see what the students do, and let's see which of the things the students do are what they call red herrings and not, not useful, in which you cut those off right away, and which of the things that they do are really good mistakes that will lead them to deeper knowledge. And so they study kids learning, um, which is so important for uh, good teaching is to understand learning. So they study learning and then these lesson studies filter up and become the teaching standards. So the, the knowledge in the teaching profession is created by teachers one-on-one -on -one studying with each other learning, which is a remarkable um, shift in the focus from teaching to learning. Margaret, it's something we constantly have to fight because again, over the 40 years, I see us deprofessionalizing teaching so often by introducing what I called packaged instruction. Right. The teachers were then to go about managing and crazy de jure ideas like pacing. 
uh, you know, everybody has to be at the same point at the same time or ridiculous things like longer school days, longer school years. If you're doing the same thing, but doing more of it, that's not gonna make a change. And we've seen so many of these get on board strategies where there's no looking left or right, only to find them left behind. But when we approach it like everybody is a learner, the teacher, the students, and from that critical inquiry approach, what a difference. And I think shifting just our terminology, it's not training teachers, it's you know professional learning and development. It, uh, those words mean a great deal symbolically, I think of, of uh, where we're at. So maybe we can shift a little bit and say in action, in teaching action research, what, what can we do differently that will um, help promote knowledge democracy? That's a difficult question. <laughs> That's <a very> difficult. <laughs> well, my better. However, <laughs> if, if I can say, let's say uh, something, uh, it has to do with the methods, the methodology you use for teaching action research. And one aspect is that I have tried, and I have told that before, is, is using the, the students' uh, reflection and narration as part of the method to, to teach action research. Because mm -hmm. it's not only that that helps them to, to, for the field work, let's say of their own dissertations or, or thesis, but also because it's more democratical. Because when you start by the students reflecting on themselves and sharing that in a group, I think it's, it's a way to, to be more democratical and it's not just the teacher explaining what it is. And so it has to do with methods and yeah. narration and reflection so that they can really think about their, not only of their own, but also of the classmates and, and the people with whom they work. This methodology, I think is more democratical in a way when yeah. you start by, by working from the people and that they feel that they are important and that they are part of a group. So it's, it's saying... like if before you start to, to learn about the concepts and you start to be more democratical yourself, sharing and, and helping others and participating yeah, modeling is what you're saying. Modeling what you want them to do um, in your mm -hmm. own practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carlos, I'm expecting you to jump out and talk about that powerful work you're doing with your students, the youth, right? In action research, they're both embracing those, those actual global kind of challenges out there and engaging in, in real work and inquiry related to them that's making a difference. So they're learning about action research, but they're also learning about the critical issues. And then their work is contributing to a global knowledge base and making a difference. I just, I'm always fascinated when I hear the members in this group sharing some of the strategies that they're using and doing. Are there are others who might wanna share some of the strategies that they've used or that they've thought about? I have uh, just three things on my slide about actions for teachers of action research. The first is um, it's possible to model and um, knowledge democratization by engaging strategically with the efforts to expand it, to develop it. The, and as a teacher, you can then share that effort on your part with your students. So they see concretely that you are working in the space that Matthew was talking about, an ecology of knowledge. So that was one. The second one was to advocate. As well. Yeah, the second one is to advocate for knowledge democratization. And that can take place at every level. Uh, my part of my decision to retire when I did was because I lost a major battle within my own academic department 
And I was actually told by the department chair, well, if you're not ready to embrace evidence-based practice, then you are not teaching ethically. And I, I just found that to be an astonishing statement. And what bothered me is that the department wasn't willing to discuss what is evidence. They, they just kind of shut me down <laughs> in, in my efforts to introduce that discussion. So I figured, okay, I, I can count votes and I see that I am in the margins now, so it's time for me to leave. Um, but I think at every level, we need to be advocating for an appreciation of an ecology of knowledges and for policies in departments, in academic units, in universities that embrace the democratization of knowledge. And then the third one I came up with is to seek balance in your own dissemination of knowledge. Um, don't just publish in formal academic journals. Use the diverse media that are now available to us to publish so that people see that you understand that while academic journals are important, that there also are other ways of disseminating knowledge. That's, that's what we try to do through Social Publishers Foundation. That's our mission is to support practitioner research. And we, we have a review process, we give detailed feedback, but we make sure that we try to make it clear to people that ours is not a, we're not a academic journal. And so I think as teachers of action research, we can also help in that respect is to show our students, well, yes, I'm published in formal journals, but I'm also disseminating research in uh, other ways. One of the things, by, by the way, in Michelle Fine's book, one of the things that they did in New York City with one of the community-based groups she worked with is they took reports on participatory research that they had done and they, they created a, a truck that can drive around the city and project the results on sides of buildings. And then they would convene dialogues with people in the community regarding the results of this research. So they would do street corner seminars, you might call them, where people could see the data that had been collected on the disproportionate use of police violence in communities of color compared to white communities. And so they, they had a big projector hooked up on the back of a truck and they could take it all over so that they weren't asking people from the community, come to the university to hear a report. They were taking it out to the streets, so to speak. So there's lots of things uh, you can do that would help your students to see that you are practicing the democratization of knowledge dissemination. I really like that, uh, that story, Lonnie. Thanks for that. It reminds me that we often talk about hard to reach groups, difficult to reach groups. It's not them that are difficult. They know where they are. It's us sometimes in the <laughs> academy are the ones that are difficult to reach. Well, well, this is one of the really beautiful things about uh, Joanne Rappaport's book is she talks about the use of the comics, the use of these beautiful illustrations that were drawn by artists to tell the stories of um, the communities. I'm fascinated by that also, and I've been trying to prepare an approach to groups of young people who are drawing comics, but are, in my view, are limiting 
their talents by only drawing, you know, stuff that reflects their musical tastes or clothing styles, whatever. But those kids who are such good artists can also share the stories of things that are happening in their communities and the efforts to improve the conditions in the communities. That, that was done by Falsborda. Do you remember the conference in Colombia? Remember uh, that they were showing us how, how that strategy was used by Falsborda in Colombia for many years and how yeah. they produce even journals in the communities. Yes. And they learned and they did action research, yeah. uh, more political, let's say, par, participatory. Yeah action research and it was just done by figures because people don't read much yeah there and that's what Matthew's comment reminded me of for example if we're trying to do youth participatory action research mm -hmm. and we're working in an inner city community with gang kids you could gain a great deal of progress with civic literacy by producing a comic book and distributing it to 400 kids in an inner city community, you'd gain far more than publishing a formal article in an academic journal. Mm. Carlos, do you, do you want to say anything about your working with youth? Because you've done quite a bit. Yes, uh, well, we are uh, just working more um, with uh, youth about the um, issue of uh, climate change and also um, contamination and all the, um, the ecological uh, problems. And uh, I think that is uh, interesting because we are doing just project-based education. And uh, one thing is that uh, the kids who decided that they will do a project they are really very interested. Yeah, in that uh, situation, uh, it's uh, much easier to work. They are really very motivated and uh, to try uh, different things because they have uh, grabbed, the, let's see, the problem, the issue of, of, the, uh, of the problem. And they try to, uh, to work with either the schools, their friends, I mean, a small community, I would say, yes, to, to find these uh, results. Mm -hmm. And around this uh, project, this problem, no, we try to teach them different things. For instance, uh, we're doing now a project about plastics and how they can replace the use of plastic for uh, uh, one use plastic, uh, try to replace with another solutions. And they are trying to work about this problem. and. Uh, um, when on the side of this uh, thing, they are learning, uh, we are bringing them, for instance, knowledge about mathematics, about chemistry, and also about government, how do the, uh, the local government works. That is the, uh, the main idea. And from time to time, there comes some things which we never thought about. And then we have to uh, tell them, let's find out. No, uh, and that's the way in which we are just uh, working and uh, always uh, saying to them, because the name of the school is uh, School of Science, no? that science is very important. And that's the reason we have to have the evidence, the evidence of, uh, uh, of the things that they are talking. Not because uh, in that case, there are many people who are very emotional and things say some things that, uh, I mean, looks uh, reasonable, but in the practice, there are some uh, some problems, some grains of salt. Let's see, <laughs> and that's how we uh, work with these projects. No, and Carlos, mm -hmm. your students have generated use mm -hmm. media, right, to generate I'll call them mini movies or mini documentaries about their work. You shared links to what they've done, and hearing that student voice around their authentic work has been very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, uh, we 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 try to uh, to share their their voice, especially not that they they should uh, tell them what they were doing. And uh, sometimes we make uh, let's say a Zoom a Zoom meeting in which they they share their story with other students and uh, the teachers of uh, the schools because I have kids from different places, different schools. Mm. 
It sounds it's wonderful work. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you would really enjoy looking at some of the work that his students have done. It's really let's publish it on Social Publishers Foundation. <laughs> we we have the capacity to upload the uh, video. So you can look at it. It's on um it's it's on the Iron Action Research site and it's also on the Star. Uh, site so you can go look at it and there's no you know cross linking it is a good idea okay do you want to uh take a few minutes to close this out with do you have any any uh thoughts lonnie that you want to leave us with some ideas about what you think we should all be doing oh well that's <laughs> what you know the those uh slides that i didn't go through if you want to share that PowerPoint, Margaret, um, people can look at, I have about five slides that address uh, or some prospects for strategies in regards to support for knowledge, democracy, and um, the attacks on democracy. Let me, there's one last slide that um, I had a quote from, James Baldwin, that I think gives us a good picture of what's at stake. His quote is, ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. Who does so, that talk about Trump? <laughs> that's, that's his, that's his. So that's James Baldwin. So that's what I would leave you with. And boy, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to meet oh. with the, the group today. We're so grateful, Lonnie. And I was just thinking, Christine had to leave, but you know, we, we always want to extend or continue our interaction. And maybe the blog, Margaret, might be a means as well to relate to this chat with the link and, and the resources and invite. Uh, more shared strategies. Margaret launched a Facebook group for our, you know, for us, and she's just over a short period of time, there's thousands of participants as well. We keep trying to engage them so we can have their shared uh, participation. Yeah. Just thinking of that, Margaret, and uh, well, we can very helpful. Um, and Godwin, he's not, he's, he's left, but uh, in, in keeping the, or trying to get the conversation going it's we haven't been very successful in getting kind of public discourse these chats are really helpful and i think that um being able to post the video and um also think about them collectively it has been great for our for our community um whether or not we're extending a further reach we, we post them but um, so I think we have to do a lot more thinking about how you extend the reach of these ideas. Um, we, we have chosen this as our topic for our um, discussion at the conference. So we will be continuing this discussion in both Spanish and English at the ARNA conference in um, uh, June. Yeah. June in Cedar City. Mm -hmm. Yes. With that, I think we should thank everybody for a very thought-provoking and interesting conversation. If anyone has any final things they want to say, we can do a quick, you know, what was the thing that stuck most in your mind from this session? Quick round, since there's a small number of us now. Pizza, what, what, what will you take away? Well, this idea of democratization of knowledge, how to start different ways particularly in certain topics like in environmental education, for example, so that it's not just the theory of the subject, what you really work, but all these social aspects, that is this, the, the part where you learn to be a citizen, mm -hmm. when you cooperate with others, when you really try to, to make in, let's say democratic ways of working in society and so how it could be applied to to knowledge to the way knowledge is taught more in a in a democratic atmosphere let's say mm -hmm. so how to reach that is, is a challenge for me really thank you very much Lonnie thank you to all <laughs> okay. 
Yes, sorry, but today my neighbors are drilling and the dogs are so excited, so I have to keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, um, very interesting, Loni, and all the comments of all of you, very provoking. And um, actually, we are preparing <clears throat> a small paper to submit tomorrow to the ARNO that talks about um, the side of the teachers that are teachers of teachers in this issue of the democratization of knowledge, how this concept pull together concerns that they are not integrated in a specific strategies to bring to the classroom. So yes, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to hear all this talk. This is an issue that <laughs> excites me. Thank you, Loni, for this um, timely provoking ideas. Thanks. And Thank Matthew. you, Gorty. <laughs> Matthew. Uh, thanks, Margaret. Uh, thanks, Loni. Um, I really enjoyed the uh, talk and discussion that we've had today. It really is at the heart of uh, why I firmly believe in action research as a positive for social change. Um, I think my takeaway is really just about what actions I can do in regards to promoting democratic methodologies. So um, I'm going to give it some thought about how my um, as a community of practice that I, I work with, how we can look at maybe having a workshop around this as well, because it's so important. Thank you for arranging this today, Margaret, um, Linda and uh, Lonnie. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I would like to thank you, Lonnie, because uh, you have brought a couple of, uh, of questions more than uh, no, that. Mm -hmm. Then I have to think about uh, the first one. It was um, a, about the concept of, let's see, uh, decolonizing knowledge, which I, th I think uh, yeah, it's uh, quite important because on one side, uh, knowledge is so open that uh, you could say, well, I mean, once you know that it exists, uh, there is no way you can erase it. You know? And uh, how can be so a uh, colonizing of, uh, of knowledge? And I think that's more, I think, of ourselves, not from the people who have the knowledge from one side. No? And the other pro problem, I think you talk, uh, it was about the democracy. I mean, action research and democratic uh, way of uh, living, it's okay. I, I agree 100%. But when we talk about uh, democracy in a country, it's uh, quite difficult, especially for for me and as Gates and also I would say for us because here in Latin America, the problem of what democracy is is very very complicated. I mean, <laughs> everybody says they are democratic, but 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 but, <laughs> no? and I will keep thinking about that. And that's uh, I mean the, the first thing that I, or the most important thing that I got from your uh, talk. No, a, a couple of problems to try to think about. <laughs> Thank you for them. <laughs> <laughs> so grateful to have problems. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, Ter Terry, I know you joined us late, but say something or... Yes, thank you so much, Margaret. I just posted in the chat, my apologies. Lonnie, I look forward to hearing the recording, Linda. I, I'm sure you'll be sending that along. And uh, yeah, so appreciate that. Lonnie, I know it was wonderful, as always. So great to hear from your expertise and brilliance. And so I will look forward to watching the recording and um, learning much. Thank you. Thank you. And for me, I was reminded that I should read Dewey's Democracy in Education again. I know that when I read it as a college student, it was a, an experience for me, a really different kind of experience, because I realized this book was written, you know, almost 100 years ago now, over 100 years ago. But I sat and read every sentence and just kind of enjoyed it as a thought provoker. Yeah. It was not like reading a story. It was like having a intellectual experience with someone who was dead. <laughs> and I, I, it was really, um, it, as a college student, it really like shook me sort of that you could write sentences that were so provocative that they could have a different meaning or a similar meaning, but in a different context so many years later. So I'm thinking if I had that experience then, 
and it's now some you know half century away from that time period i should go and read it again and see what now what you know margaret now thinks of what margaret thought then so i think that's something i'm going to do hmm fascinating yeah so i think that wraps up our session um thank you lonnie thank you linda for organizing it and Let's let's all go away and think about how we can work hard to inspire those that we come in contact with to understand how important it is to value the thinking and the contribution of every citizen as they make their way in knowledge creation, which is what your life really is, a problem-solving knowledge creation journey. And mm -hmm. valuing those journeys is really important. And, and Margaret, we will, um, as we've been doing at our, on our Arna Star community website, we have a page for chat and we will post this one, including the, the recording reading Thank list you. and the PowerPoint that um, Lonnie, you know, so graciously yeah. prepared and shared with us today. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you.